Psalms chapter 141. We are moving along here on these Psalms. We're almost at the end point. This one won't be uh, that long, um, but it is a good song. This is another Psalm of David. Um, it only has 10 verses in it. And so we're going to take our time, outline these 10 verses, and we're going to truly just ask the Lord to give us an uh, insight onto what these verses uh, say and more importantly, what the Lord is trying to say to us through these verses, through these particular uh, portions of Scripture. And we thank God for um, another opportunity just to be able to do that. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get the reading in. Let's take a listen and see what we have here for Psalms 141. Chapter 141. Lord, I cry unto thee. Make haste unto me, give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity, and let me not eat of their dainties. Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. When their judges are overthrown in stony places, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth, as when one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. But mine eyes are unto thee, O God the Lord. In thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me, and the gins of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets, whilst that I withal escape. All right. Once again, a beautiful psalm. And if you remember from last week, we were looking at another psalm that was very similar to this. And this is a situation where... Um, good evening. Good evening, Kim. Good to uh, hear you and see you on today. We're at Psalms 141. Okay. All right. And, um, and so, uh, as I was just saying, this psalm is a psalm similar to the one we looked at last week. And the interesting thing that we see here, and we try to point out a lot of times when people think about the book of Psalms, they always are thinking about, well, this is just, you know, praise and, and, and uplifting and lifting up the Lord. But as I tried to point out, each time we came across it, there is almost just as many psalms about just worship but praise and thanking God for, one, for wonderful things as there are psalms that say, Lord, help me because I have an enemy. And my enemy is trying to do me in. And he's gaining ground. And I know I can't defeat the enemy without your help. And this is another psalm like that. And sometimes people say, well, why would a psalm like that be considered a psalm? I thought psalms were praise. Remember, the praise is the fact that I know I have help when I can't help myself. That's the praise. That's the thankfulness. That's why we're glad. And that's where the joy. So you're in a tough situation. You're not enjoying the circumstances. But what you're happy about is you have a redeemer. You have a way uh, out. You have a person to go to. You have a God that you can relay your cares. Like Jesus said, cast all your cares on me, for I care for you. That's praiseworthy. Therefore, when you're dealing with your enemy, it is an act of praise when you go to God and ask him to carry you through it recognizing that you're thanking and praising God for his ability to do what you can't do. And that's what all of this is about. Yes, we praise God for salvation. Why? Because God can save us. Why? Because we can't save ourselves. God can bless us. We thank God for blessings. Why? Because we can't bless ourselves. We thank God for keeping us. Why? Because like the Bible says, if the watchman don't, if the Lord don't watch the city, the watchman watches in vain. So anything that we do, we're going to need God and we lean on him and we praise God for that. So we also praise God when we are dealing with a foe, an enemy or the devil or evil spirits 
or antichrist. All of that is still praiseworthy because we still need God's assistance and we thank God for that. So when we get into this and we see here that uh, David is starting off right from the bat. He's not even, you know, hesitating. He's going right in and letting folks know, you know, I'm going to the Lord. Good evening, Haywood. How are you, sir? All right. Sorry. That's all right. We're on Psalms 141. All right. So look what he says here. He starts off by saying, Lord. Now, we try to point this out quite often because we want to make sure that we keep this in mind. When you call God Lord or anybody Lord, that means you are willing to do what they say. I'm, if I'm calling you Lord, I'm listening to you and going to obey what you say. But why? Because you are Lord or my Lord. Or you are the Lord of circumstances or the Lord of the situation. You know, the Lord of the house. Whoever is the Lord. In other words, he's the one that gives the instructions. Jesus said that himself. He said, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? If you're going to call me Lord, you should do what I say. So David starts right off and saying, Lord, that's a, a, a quick admission. I'm ready to do whatever you tell me based on what I'm going to share with you. So, Lord, I'm going to share something with you. And whatever you tell me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And that's why we call him Lord. Now, how often do we apply that to our lives? When the Lord tells us to do things, we say, well, I don't know the Lord. Yes, he put it in your heart. He put it in your spirit. He put it in your mind. We know what to do. We know what's right. God has given us. He has spoken to all of us. However, do we choose to block it out? Ignore it? Say it's too hard? Say it's unfair? Give all kinds of excuses? Remember the one the Lord invited those individuals to the, to the uh, wedding banquet? And, and one by one, they began to do what? Make excuses. And so, therefore, we got to make sure that we don't do that. Uh, good evening, Beverly. Good to see you. Good evening. We're on Psalms. Apologize for my tardiness. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Glad you're here. We're on Psalms 141. All right. And we're Thank just, you. Just getting Perfect. started. All right. And so, David starts off. And he says, Lord. And then he says, now he's saying, Lord. And then the next thing he says is, I cry. Mm. So he's, he's, Lord, I know you can handle all things. And whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. But right now, in this moment, today, I'm crying. I got tears. Well, anybody ever have tears? Anybody ever had something they cried about? Mm. You had that moment where you were weeping and sad? All right. And so it's important for us to, to keep in mind that those things um, are real and they happen. And just because they happen, don't, that doesn't stop God from being God. He's still Lord. Even though you may be crying, you may be heartbroken, you may have tears, you may be sad. God is still God. And we should always remember that. And that's what David did. He's in a tough situation where he's broken hearted. He's disappointed at circumstances and situations, but he goes right to his Lord and he tells him what's going on. I cry unto thee. And what is he doing? He's coming to the Lord in a prayer, in a, in a sense of, of humbling himself before God, but he's doing it with a hard, broken, and sad heart. Make haste unto me. I am in urgent need. You ever be like, I don't know what I'm going to do because the problem is here now. I, I was wondering what's going to happen. It's here now, and I still don't know what to do. Urgent need. So he's, he's asking God, God, I need your help now. He said, make haste unto me. Give ear. In other words, Lord, I know you can hear me. And that's kind of a rhetorical question. Lord, give ear. You know God hears you. But he's letting God know, Lord, I, I need you to listen to me. Can I get assurance? Can I get confirmation? Can I get a, a clear uh, uh, understanding that you're hearing me? I need to see a sign, an action, or a comfort, 
or a sense of your calmness to come over me. I, whatever it is you're going to do, Lord, can we do it now? You ever have the one of those prayers where it's like, I need an answer now. You know, now I, I can uh, admit that sometimes on my job when I'm doing stuff and I, my job all day long, what I do, people call, they got problems. I'm, I'm, they don't call me unless they got a problem. That's part of what my job is. And sometimes people will have an issue and a problem that I don't, I'm like, I don't know the answer to this. And this person needs help like right now. And I'll say a prayer on my job about my job. I said, Lord, help me to see what this person needs. How to and and, you know, and usually you don't have a whole lot of time to fix it. They need to have that thing fixed up and wrapped up. Usually within about a half hour. And a lot of times I can't I can't even number how many times God will give me a, a thought, something will pop in my head, and and uh, and you you I'll give it to them. They're like, oh, okay, let me let me see if this works. Oh, that worked. Thank you. You know, and they're going on about their business. I just say, Lord, I thank you, because I had no idea what to do, and this was an urgent situation. Yes, sir. You know, a lot of time we don't realize how much God is talking to us when we're doing stuff. You talk about your job, and I talk about my job. And I get stuck doing this carpentry work and painting and stuff, and I can't figure something out. And I said, oh, God, I don't know what to do. And something will come here in my mind and say, well, why don't you just take it and go like that? And I go like that, and I say, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And that's God helping us. But we sometimes, I don't think we realize. We don't. That's right. That's right. We forget that God is working in us and through it. You, well, hey, well, you remember my, my, my steps, right? I remember when I was telling you that I need to do something to get my steps fixed when it was all just wood? Oh yeah, and uh, and Miss Penny was like, "You gonna figure this out?" She said, "You gonna?" And she kept telling me, "You gonna figure it out?" And I kept saying, "I don't know. I don't. I have no idea what to do." Because uh, it was it was it was unique the way the steps were. It was like you had to do something a little bit, and without being long winded, the Lord gave me an answer. I I kind of woke up one morning and I was like, I told my wife, I said, "I think I know what to do." And I, I did it, and it came out just good. And you see them, hey, what you see? It came out. Oh, they look good. They it look came good. out real good, right? I, I was, I, I walk in, I see it. I was like, oh, you did that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, God does speak to us in a lot of things, and we sometimes got to remember to just say, Lord, thank you for doing that, because those are the things that are praiseworthy. The prayer was a praise, Lord. I'm coming to you because I know you can do something that I don't seem to have the the uh, wherewithal to do. I don't have the expertise. I don't have the experience to know what to do. And he just gives it to you. And so that's why you look at David here. He's knowing. He's not saying, God, I don't think you can hear me when he says, give ear to me. He's like, I know you hear. It's a rhetorical statement. Give ear to me. Like he's saying, I know you're hearing this. Unto my voice, when I cry unto thee. All right. So you're in that urgent circumstance. And what we should do, because you're not in urgent circumstances every day, but when they do show up, a lot of times they show up out of the blue. You didn't plan for it. You didn't think about it. But it's now, oh, now we got to do something real quick. That's a great time to say a prayer. Why you're moving, why you're walking, why you're driving, whatever you're doing to take care of the urgent situation, still pray in your spirit. And if you can pray out loud, you know, however you want to pray, you pray. And, and see how God will guide and lead you. This is not hocus pocus. This ain't no magic trick. And this is not some kind of genie that you rub and ask to give you three wishes. This is a relationship and a communication with the God of the universe. That we should try to remember to, to, to utilize for our benefit. Not for God. Rather, if we pray to God, he's God. If we choose, I'm not praying to no God. He's still God. I got a guy on my job. He don't believe it. He goes, I don't believe in praying to no God. I don't. I, I do stuff myself. Well, because he don't believe it, that doesn't stop God from being God. He's still God, whether you accept him or not. He's still who he is. He's God all by himself, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. Look at verse two. But these people, these people that say that, then why when they get in trouble? I know one guy told me, oh, I don't believe in God. And his dog got sick and he asked me to pray for his dog. Yep, but they, they, reach, they reach for <laughs> everything. Like, yep. I'm like, dude, you don't believe in God. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, but that's the, you know, when, when, you know, people don't believe in God, but then when the lightning bolts start coming and the volcanoes happen and the earthquakes, all, all of a sudden they start praying to whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, so you might as well find God for, for yourself so you can build that confidence and, and, and that relationship with him. So you will know that God will take care of you. You'll have that peace. And that's the peace was like that we, we learn to grow into. God's going to take care of us. Now, a lot of times when you first get started and you're trying to, you know, you, 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 you're hoping he takes care of it. You, oh, Lord, I hope you do. But you're not, you're not confident. But as you keep going, you're like, well, I'm confident. I don't know what he's going to do, and I'm not even sure if I'm going to like what he does, but I know he's going to take care of it. And ultimately, whether I think about it from the beginning or learn about it later, in the end, it will ultimately be for my benefit. And that's the thing we have to remember. So he says, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. In other words, it's, when you walk into a room, that has incense burning, almost as soon as you get into the room, you will what? You recognize the smell. It's a, it's a, a uh, immediate uh, uh, recognition that it's there. And that's what David is saying. Can you allow my prayers to capture your attention like incense in a room would capture? And then he says, and lift up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And the sacrifice was when they would, they would sacrifice uh, uh, the, the, the sheep and the lambs and the goats and the bullocks and all that. Uh, and so when that's happening, they are uh, putting those things onto the fire. And when you walk into a place and you see a fire, you know, let, a, let a fire happen anywhere in any neighborhood. People see it. You can't hide it. It's visible. And so what David is saying, I want my prayer to capture your attention. Now, once again, that's kind of a rhetorical comment because there is nothing that goes unattended by God. God knows and sees all. But David's trying to emphasize more so for whose purpose? For his purpose. He's trying to encourage himself. God, I know you hear me. Because God does. David making that prayer is not going to make God more God or less God. He's going to always still be God, who God is. But that prayer that David is saying is to give him the confidence within himself that I'm going to hold on and believe God's going to carry me through. And sometimes you got to say words in your heart and in your mind to yourself, even while you're praying to God, to help build up your confidence in God. And so, yeah, I'm, Lord, I know you can do this. I know, yes, you know God. But you're saying that to help yourself. And that's the beauty of, of a prayer like this. All right? So he's saying, like an incense or like an evening sacrifice, I know my prayer has captured your attention. You see and hear me, God. You know what's going on. Verse 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. And now what David is saying, Lord, I don't want to say anything foolish. Because I'm in an urgent situation. And you know, when you do things and you do, do it real quick without really sitting down and give it thought, sometimes you can say something pretty silly. Say something, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said it like that. Uh, I should have said it a different way. It didn't come out right. And so what David is saying, Lord, I know how I can be. I know how my mouth can be. David is not a person that's lost for words. Remember when, remember when he was a young boy and he went down to give his brothers uh, 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 dinner and they were out there hiding from Goliath and Goliath was saying all that stuff about the, the, the children of Israel. And what did David say? He said, why are y'all letting this uncircumcised Philistine curse the God of of our fathers. Now, David, right off the bat, called the man an uncircumcised Philistine. He's talking about his private parts in public in front of everybody. That's David. David is not lost for words. All right? And so he, he just comes right out and says, now, I know I can say all kinds of things. I don't want to say the wrong thing because I know how I can be. I can be quick with the lips. And a lot of times, people can be quick... 
I, I have to tell you now, you know, I love my wife, but man, when she gets to going and saying things, she can tell me off like that. Ain't got to say a whole lot of words. It just got me straight. I'm like, okay, I got it. I'm good. And she puts uh -huh. me, she puts me right where I need to be. Yeah, yeah. I'm Sister Penny. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll I'll give you an example. Oh, come on! <laughs> she's like, she's like, don't pick on me. <laughs> Let me give you an example. <laughs> One day I was, I had, I got tired. I was like, you know what? I walked in that bathroom, and that bathroom had every kind of stuff in it. She had all kinds of, you know, the women products, the stuff, stuff for the hair, the skin, the nails, and everything. And I, all I got was my little shaving kit and everything. And she moved my shaving kit off to the side. Talking about you, you, you didn't got it in the right place. I'm like, well, it ain't got no place else to put it because you got everything else in the bathroom. And I, then I asked. I got, I, I got bold now. I got bold, Haywood. And I said, why do you have to have... Huh? I said, start praying. I know, start praying. That's what I do. Uh -huh. That's my husband tenfold. Yep. And I just start praying. And I, I said to her, I said, why do you have to have so many things in this bathroom? She turned and looked at me, and real quick, not a whole lot of words, she said, Wayne, that's what women do. You want to be married to a man? Ooh. Yeah, that's what I said. I said, okay, you know what? No, I don't want to be married to a man. I'm glad to be married to a woman, and if that's what, that's what, that's what women do, I'm going to let you be a woman. And I never complained about it since. And let her now, have wait, her. So let then her. now I'm confused because I'm married to a woman. <laughs> so how do I deal with this? <laughs> this is another subject. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, I have no space. Oh boy. But go ahead. <laughs> well, that's, mm -hmm. that's, 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 I can't answer that one. That's another one to bring to God. <laughs> right, exactly. Every, I just pray. Like I said, I just go in and I just pray. And just pray. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah. Uh, and that's what this is about. This is about when you find yourself in a situation, and sometimes you might want to cry. I, I can't. I ain't got no space in here. Let me pray. But I got straight, and, and I'm good. I, I, I'm not. I'm happy you know, being married to a woman. I like that. Thank God for that. And so, David is doing that here. He's saying, you know, he says, "Set my watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. God, I don't want to say something stupid." And sometimes we got to do that. We got to be like, Lord, help me here. You know? And, and something, now the story I gave you was more lighthearted and it really didn't cause no harm. But sometimes you can say things that can actually be more uh, detrimental and can cause more pain and more suffering. And those are the ones that we really want to make sure that we're bringing those to God. All right? Look at verse 4. Incline not my heart to do anything any evil thing. Now, this is important because when you are under pressure, a lot of times evil things pop in your mind. You know, when people, when somebody don't have, they can think of all kinds of evil ways to get what they want. Lie, steal, kill, uh, uh, misuse, uh, they do uh, con games, um, mislead people, all kinds of things that people can do when trying to get what they want when they feel they can't get it any other way. So your heart has to be set right. I'm not going to go the evil way to, to satisfy or answer this problem. Because a lot of times you can't answer the problem with some evil actions. But it won't be a problem that will not come back to haunt you later. When you do evil, down the road, guess what's going to show up again? That same evil. When you do wrong to solve a problem, the problem may get fixed for that particular time, but it might pop back up again, and sometimes in a whole different way. And sometimes it shows up not in your time, but in the next generation. All of a sudden, that child comes. You ever see... Uh, grandparents say, I can't wait for you to have your own children so they can treat you the way you treat me. Mm -hmm. And so and a lot of times, that's exactly what happens. They get some kids and they're like, I don't know how you dealt with all of this. Yeah, well, I dealt with it. Now it's your turn. And so 
He wants, David is saying, incline my heart. I don't want to do anything evil. To, uh, uh, to practice wicked works, I don't want to. I don't want to go down to take any advice from the devil, because the devil can give you an answer, but you don't want his answer. The well, devil gave exactly. He gave three answers to Jesus, and Jesus rejected all three of them when Satan tempted him in the wilderness. And each time, Jesus used what? The scripture. He used the word of God. And said, it is written, Satan. And so he had, and that's what we got to do. We got to use the scripture, use the word of God, rather than using the evil, wicked devices of this culture. Yeah. Of, of our day. Right? And so, it says, um, wicked works with men that work iniquity. Sometimes you're following the crowd. Well, this is, everybody's doing it. I'm going to do it too. Everybody, everybody's lying. Everybody's stealing. Everybody's cheating. I'm a lie, steal, and cheat too. We don't want to do that. We no. want God's answer. God will give you an answer, all right? And that's the thing we got to make sure that we we lean on. And sometimes you got to just wait on God's answer, all right? Yeah. And let me not eat their uh, dainties. In other words, I don't want to eat the pleasure stuff that they're offering. You know. Because sometimes they'll, they'll give you, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of nice stuff here just to kind of, you know, befriend you, get you kind of kind of caught in. It's like the drug dealers, you know, back in the day. They would give it you that. you over. That's right. They give you that first, that first uh, hookup, that first fix for nothing. Because they know if you yeah. get hooked, guess what? You're coming back. And so you got to watch out for that. Don't take the dainties of the devil. Mm-hmm. They're not good. Uh, they may taste good in the beginning, but they will hurt you in the end. That's right. Amen. There's a lot of things. You know, the Bible says stolen water tastes sweet. Mm. But, the, but the, the end of that is death. So when you take something that you shouldn't take, it may be sweet in the beginning, but eventually you're going to pay. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you more than you're willing to pay. These a lot of times become generational issues, unfortunately, and they just don't stick with you, but they're passed down. Verse five, let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. I rather for to, I rather be smitten or chastised or suffer for righteous sake. So if I'm going to be smitten, let it be smitten for righteousness. Let it be smitten for something that I did properly. I don't mind being, being mistreated because somebody thinks I love Jesus. Or somebody thinks I'm weird because I believe in God. Or I walk by faith. If people want to say that about me, if they want to laugh and tease and call me all kinds of names, because I believe in God, because I accept Jesus as my Savior, because I believe in the rapture, I believe in a heaven and a hell. If people want to laugh at me and tease me and say all manner of stuff about that for me, fine. I'll take that. And Lord, I, I'll, I'll thank you, God, that they are teasing me because I love you. I'll take that. I'll, I'll, I'll take the, the righteous smiting. I'll take the righteous judgment. Right. Um, and then he says, and let, me be rep uh, and let him reprove me. All right. Who? Righteousness. Let righteousness reprove me. Because righteousness, is, if it's reproving you, it's going to do what? Correct you rightly. It's going to move you in the right place. If you fall down, and, and unfortunately, if you break a bone, and you go back to the doctor, you go to the doctor to get the bone, the bone reset, you know what they got to do? They got to stretch that bone out and replace it. You know what that's going to cause? Pain. If you get your shoulder out of joint and you got to knock your shoulder back in joint, you, I don't know if you ever had that. That hurts. It's going to cause pain. But in order for it to get set right, it has to hurt initially. You broke it. You took it out of joint for whatever happened. But if you want to get it right, you got to suffer that initial pain. Now, once we get it set, the pain won't be as bad. You'll still have some pain, but you still won't have, you won't have that, major, that first pain when it first gets put in place, hurts. 
And that's why a lot of times they got to knock you out, give you all kinds of anesthesia and everything before they even do it. All right? So all of this is righteous pain. It's going to hurt, but it's going to be good for you. And God uh, 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 does that unto us a lot. And we don't like it. We don't like to be when God sets our broken heart right. That causes pain. Just like you setting a broken, a broken bone correctly. When God sets your broken spirit right. He, he sets your thinking. Your thinking crooked and, and off. And God resets your attitude and the way you see things. And you begin to recognize, I, I, I got to get myself together here because I'm not doing this right. And sometimes it's, it hurts because you're like, well, Lord, how come you're not correcting other people? Because sometimes you think that he's always correcting you. And the reality of it is he's correcting everybody. But a lot of times you so, you know, hurt with your understanding. And when God shows you something, it will. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. When God shows you something that you have to uh Correct in yourself, it can break your heart and make you sad. Well, you know, but then you say to yourself, But if God is telling me I got to fix this, I'm going to fix it, even though it's going to make my heart sad. But I'm going to fix it all this time and all this, all the, those other actions that I was doing, thinking I was okay, I wasn't doing it the way God wanted it done, and God wants me to fix it. Now, the choice is, Will you fix it? Will you do it? Will you take the pain and the suffering and do it? And sometimes it's not easy, but it's important. Let, the, let God's chastisement, let his correction come upon you. The toughest one is when God allows you to be chastised and corrected by somebody that's worse than you, in your, in your opinion. Somebody that don't even believe in God. That's what happened to Israel. When Israel got chastised by God, God allowed another heathen nation to come and, and uh, beset them to the point where the people began to call, call and, and serve and worship God again. And that's the whole, you know, one of the minor prophets is called Habakkuk. That's what the story of Habakkuk is like. Habakkuk was saying, Lord, you got to fix this problem. And God says, I'm going to fix it. And Habakkuk kept saying, well, tell me how you're going to fix it. And he said, no, I'm not going to tell you. Because if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. He, he said, you wouldn't believe it even if I told you. And Habakkuk said, yes, I will tell me. And he said, okay, I'm going to use the Babylonians and the, and the, and the uh, Assyrians and all these heathen nations to come in and correct Israel. And he said, I can't believe you said that. You're going to use somebody worse than us to correct us? And God said, yes, I am. And then after I'm finished with them correcting you, then I will correct them. I will handle them, but I'm going to let them do what they need. And so a lot of times when God brings his correction, we may not like the method that he uses, but it's still God. He's still corrected. And David recognizes this. Okay. Um, look at, um, uh, boy, verse, uh, verse five, let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me. It shall be excellent oil. Okay? I like when I'm corrected by something that's going to get me in the right direction. If you're lost and somebody tells you, wow, you know what? You've been driving the wrong way for 20 miles. And he says, well, the first thing you got to do is go back those same 20 miles that you came. And then instead of making that left, you got to make the right. And you can be like, well, I don't want to go back those same 20 miles I came. That's the only way you're going to get back there, brother. You got to go back the same path you came to get here. You're going to walk that same path back. But then when you get to that same point where you made the wrong turn, this time you're going to make the right turn. Same thing in our lives. A lot of times God will allow us to have to go. You got to go back over some things that you already had to deal with in your life and deal with it again. And then God will say, now at this point, you're going to make a proper decision. You're going to make a decision based on... Uh, my direction rather than your own heart and your own thinking. All right. And so it's like excellent oil. Allow them to reprove me, which shall not break my head. It won't destroy you. It won't kill you. 
It's not a bullet shot to the head. It's a bullet shot to the heart. It's going to break your own way of thinking. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Every man seems right in his own, in his own ways, in his own eyes. But you're not, and I'm not. So therefore, I got to lean on God. And why am I leaning on God? And why am I accepting this? this? Because I'm in trouble. That's where he started off. He started off crying. But at least he recognized, Lord, I'm crying. I need you to fix this. However, if I need you to do something in me to fix it, do it. If you got to break my uh, 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 circumstances, break it and then reset it. If you got to put my, my thinking uh, th this out of joint back in the joint, knock it back in the joint so I can think right. I can move right. I can, I can behave proper. Because a lot of times our actions and our thinkings are out of joint. And you're walking around here mentally crippled with your decision making because you're, you're not thinking spiritually or biblically. We're thinking from the decisions of this culture which has very little connection to what God is trying to do. Mm -hmm. All right. And he says, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. Now, I'm going to pray. You straighten me all out. Do what you got to do. Reset whatever you got to reset. But what I don't want to be is part of their calamity. When you come in and smack them down because they don't know you as God, like I do, I'm going to listen to your correction and I'm going to do it. They're not even going to hear your correction. They're not even tuned in to what you're saying. You're talking to them and all they hear is blah, 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 blah. But when you talk to me, I hear, get your heart right, get your thinking right, get your walk right, get your lips right, get your tongue right. I'm hearing it and I'm trying to do it and they're not doing it. So when the calamity comes, because I listened and obeyed you and followed you as who? As Lord, I'm not in the place that they're in when calamity comes, when destruction comes, when disaster comes. All right. And I'm not talking about like naturally. I'm talking about spiritual disaster, spiritual calamities. I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to be at the white throne judgment. Everybody at the white throne judgment is being told that they did not. Do what God told them. So I'm not going to be there. That's a calamity judgment. I don't want to be there. Why? Because I already judge myself. The white throne judgment is there to judge people that refuse to judge themselves. I've already judged myself. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm born in sin. I know I'm shaped in iniquity. I know I got issues. I know I need God. I admit it. I confess. I'm sick and I need the physician. So, I'm already judged. There are a lot of people that say, ain't nothing wrong with me. I don't believe I'm sinning. I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. And I don't believe that no God's going to ever judge me. Well, you can think that. That doesn't change what's real. It doesn't, it doesn't move God one bit because you don't believe that he is the God of God, Lord of Lord, and King of Kings. He's still that. And everybody that stands in that white throne judgment is going to be dealt with. The Bible says he's going to get books and a book's going to be open and he's going to have other books. And he's going to have the book of life and they will see where their name has been blotted out. It's not a fun thing. That's calamity. That's disaster. Verse 6. When their judges are overthrown in stony places, they shall hear my words for they are sweet. When what is overthrown? The, 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 it says, when their judges are overthrown in stony places. What are stony places? Remember the parable that Jesus talked about, about the seed that fell amongst the, amongst the, the uh, stony places? It said it, had, it said it rose up quick. But the, mo the moment that what happened? That the sun came up, it withered away. Why? Because it had no depth to it. So you got a lot of people that can talk, they can talk about you know, God and the Bible, but they don't have no real depth to it. It's like a stony place. And so those individuals will be judged. You knew, you understood it. You didn't, it wasn't like you didn't believe, but you didn't have any depth. You're not putting God in your heart 
a lot of people have God on their surface. I want God to bless me. I want God to give me a good job and a good house and a good, a, a good car. I want God to bless my health. I want him to heal my problems. I want God to take care of that. But I'm not trying to know him as my director and my Lord and my Savior. I want God to bless me here on earth. Well, I, I want God to bless me here on earth too, but my main concern is that I know God. Oh, that I might know you. Because if I, and, and one way to get to know God is to be like what David said. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. If you know God like that, I can go to some bad situations, just like how this psalm is talking about. David starts off the psalm talking about, Lord, I cry. When you can go to those circumstances and be confident that God is with me, I'm in this valley of the shadow that I will fear no evil. Why? Because I'm big and bad? No. Because I got the strength, I'm smart, I'm clever, or oh, I got a lot of money. No, because thou art with me. Because thou art with me. So that's the key. Do you want to have a relationship with God where you know he's with you and you're walking with him? That's the key. That's the million dollar thing. Not the million dollar money, but the relationship that you have with God. That's the thing that brings you through. Okay? Verse 7. Our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth as when one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. Now he's going back and talking about his problem. This is how I feel, God. I know who you are. I don't want to say anything wrong. I understand that there are wicked things around me. But let me tell you, I feel like my bones have been scattered. Well, why is that? Well, this is how the people around David have treated him. All right, this is what he's dealing with. Now, when we get into um, the book of First and Second Psalms and, and in the book of uh, First and Second Kings, we'll see all of this stuff that happened to David. Uh, uh, first, and second, first and Second Samuel, I meant to say. Samuel. Samuel. And so when we get into that, we, we will see all of that that David goes through. We're going to see some of the stuff that he dealt with when he's do, dealing with Saul and, and, and dealing with, you know, uh, all these other uh, different uh, things that he has to go through as being uh, chosen by God to be the king. Uh, and we'll see some of the things and we'll understand why David prayed some of the prayers he prayed in these books, in the book of Psalms. All right? But he's saying... Um, you know, right now, I, I, feel like I, I feel like a piece of wood has been cut down. I feel like a, uh, uh, my bones have been scattered. All right? Verse 8. And, and well, before I get to verse 8, your feelings are real, but sometimes we got to learn not to lean to our feelings, but to lean to what the Word of God says. We got we to gotta do, do what the Scripture says. Encourage yourself through lean the Word of God. That's right. What would you say, bro? Lean not to your own understanding. That's right. Lean not to your own understanding. That's right. Exactly. Verse 8. But my eyes are unto thee. So my bones are scattered. All right. Uh, I feel like I'm at the, 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 uh, the mouth of the grave. I feel like I'm, out, I'm about to die almost. I feel like wood has been cut up. But my eyes are on thee. I'm not going to focus on my problems. I'm going to focus on you. And that's how you get through that. And that's about the best thing I can say. I, 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 go ahead. I said I had to highlight that one. Yeah, that's right. That's important. Because that's where you get the victory. Not because the problem's gone. But because you're focusing on God, not the problem. Therein is the real gift. If you can focus on God in your problem, he will carry you through. But the thing is, a lot of times we want to focus on God, then we go back and look and see if the problem's still there. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do it like that. You just got to focus on God. And just, you know, sometimes you, you ever see that, you ever watch the movie and the guy's sitting there and, and the monster or the villain sneaking up behind him. You're like, turn around, turn around. You're like, you know, he's right there. And sometimes, you know, we understand that, but when it comes down to this, we can't turn around. Our eyes got to be on who? On Jesus. If the devil's behind me, I know 
It don't matter if I see him. If I turn around and look at the devil, what am I going to do? Go boo? He ain't going to run from me. Remember that the, the seven sons of, of Siva? They tried to cast out the devil uh, out of the people. And the, and, the, and the evil spirit said, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who are you? All right. So I can't spook the devil. I can't spook the evil spirits. So if I'm looking at them and they're looking at me, what's, what is that going to prove? So looking at the problem, looking at the issue that the devil creates won't solve it. You got to look to Jesus. You got to look to God. And, and the problem is probably still there. I wonder if the problem is still there. Yeah, it's probably still there. But don't turn and look at it. Look at God. Watch God handle it. God will scare them all. He will beat them down. He will reprove them and push them back. All right? And so it's important that we keep our eyes on God. It says, let me just read 8 again. But my eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord. In thee is my trust. Leave not my soul uh, destitute. I don't want to trust in anything but God. If I don't trust in you, then I am destitute because then I have no hope. I have nothing. If I can't trust in God, then I can't fix the problem. See, if I, if I don't trust in God, then I ain't, I'm not expecting to go to heaven. If I'm not going to trust in God, I, I'm not believing I'm going to have eternal life if I choose not to trust in God. I'm not going to have eternal life, but I am going to trust in Him. And I'm going to keep Him. And, and somebody might say, well, yeah, but I don't see no evidence of eternal life. I don't see no evidence of heaven. You can't put God in a test tube and examine Him like you would do some kind of chemical or some kind of material. You only can come to God half. By faith, faith. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Exactly. You we got by faith and not by sight. You gotta go by faith. You just gotta believe. You gotta have Without faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Exactly. Exactly. And so that's what we have to make sure that we're doing. We gotta relate to God by faith. That's how we hold God's hand. We hold God's hand by faith. He holds our hand by his strength. And that's the key. Verse 9. Keep me. Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> Keep me, Keep God. Me. I tell you. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me. I know there are snares. <clears throat> there are traps. All kinds of things. But then he doesn't just call it. He just doesn't deal with the snares. Those are little traps that you don't recognize you walk onto and all of a sudden you fall into. But look what else he says. Uh, Which they laid for me and the gins of the workers of iniquity. Now we know what the gins are. These are people that deal with manipulation. They deal with all kinds of pressure putting you into certain circumstances. It's, it's manipulating your attitude and forcing you to do things. It's akin to witchcraft. And there are a lot of people that love to exercise that. They love to kind of beat you down into a corner where they feel they got you controlled. You can't go to the left. You can't go to the right. I got you trapped. Now you got to do what I tell you to do. And you got to watch out for people like that. They are working a, a, a devilish incantation, even though they may not know it. That's how society. That's how a lot of society is. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And people love to manipulate other people. Oh, well, you better do what I say or this. You better do what I say or that. You, know, don't, don't, you don't want to ever get caught up into that. Well, I'm going to punish you because if you don't do this, I'm going to do this to you. That's what witch, witchcraft is all about. It's that manipulation. And we got to make sure that we're not working those kind of works of, 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 of that type of iniquity. And, and in the Bible, it's called jinn. And that word is if you think of the uh, the root of that word, the word genie comes out of that word of jinn. Right? So the, a lot of you know the stories about genies, you know, Aladdin's lamp, you rub the lamp and you get the witch. And the key behind the, all of those stories of the genies was that the genies would grant you these wishes, but each of the wishes also came with what? Unexpected bad consequences. 
So you got what you wanted, but you didn't get it the way you wanted it. You can't. You got additional problems with the so-called wish you got, and that's the very spirit of the devil. That's why he, what he tried to offer to Jesus. Let me give you. I know you're hungry. Turn the rocks into bread. I'm trying to talk you into do something. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. So a lot of times there's a snare which you fall into and you know you're trapped. But the gene or the genie or the gin looks good. Looks nice. Sounds sweet. Tastes delicious. But it's a trap. It's the devil. And sometimes you don't work. And so David is saying, keep me from the snares and from the gins. The, and these, these gins, their ultimate work is what? Iniquity. Sin. Right? It's dealing with what it's going to pull you down and it's going to get you involved in sinful actions. All right, our final verse here, verse 10. It says, Let the wicked fall into their own net, whilst that I uh, will have escaped. So, what David is saying, I know they're setting the traps. Who set it? Satan, evil spirits, the devil. All of this is going on. The spirit of Antichrist, John said, is already in the world. And it's working everything it can work to manipulate and trap people. But I just thank God that God can break every snare. He can, he can deliver from every enticement. He can make us aware of that which seems good but is not. God can give us those kind of directions. He can give us a good spiritual compass so we can know the true way to go, which way to walk, how to talk. David saying once again, don't let my mouth, you know, there, there was an old saying, don't let your mouth get you into a place that your behind can't get you out of. Remember those old saying they used to say back in the day? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you, you, can, you can say a whole lot of stuff and all of a sudden you're in some serious trouble. David is saying, don't let me say something that's going to cause me to have uh, further. Don't, I don't want to exacerbate the problem. I want to be able to follow your lead, God. And when it's all said and done, let the people that are setting the traps, doing the snares, trying to do all the tricks, let them fall into their own net. And allow me to escape. Show me the way out. That's the key. Because see, there is a way. God's like, I'm going to show you the way out. Sometimes the way out is around. Sometimes it's under. Sometimes it's over. But sometimes it's through. That's what happened with the Hebrew boys. What was the way out of the fiery furnace? Through the furnace. What was Daniel's way out of the lion's den? Through the lion's den. He had to go in there. He had to go in and then come out. He had to go through it. And sometimes God will take you through your problem. You're saying, God, move this problem. Urgent. Got to go through it. Got to get out. I can't have it. It's, it's right here. Oh, no. And then all of a sudden, you're right in the midst. God, where are you? And God's like, I'm right here with you. In the problem with you. Now, that's amazing. When the Hebrew boys got thrown in the, thrown in the fire, where are you, God? I'm in the fire with you. All right. I'm here, and the fire is burning, and it's hot, but you're not going to be destroyed by the fire. You're going through it. And those are the ones that are more scary, I have to admit. You know, when you've got to go through your problem, <laughs> while you're going through it, God is isolating and insulating and keeping you in the midst. And while you're in the problem, the other thing you got to be careful of is while you're in the problem, people are looking at you. See? Look at him. Where's your God now? Look at you in the problem. That's what they said to Jesus. Oh, if you be the Christ, come down for the, from the cross. Where was Jesus? He was in the midst of the problem. He went through the difficulty. He got whipped and beaten, spit upon. They smacked him and punched him and, and whipped his back, nailed him to a cross, and then laughed and teased him while he was hanging there. If you be the son of God, you got others, you healed others, heal yourself. Come down from the cross if you be the, the son of God, and then we'll believe you. He's got all of that. He went through the cross and came out resurrected. He went through death and came out of it. 
And so there are some times when he's going to allow us to go through our problem. We like him to move the problem. I know I do. I want him to move yeah. the problem. I want, I want him to send me around it over and over. Yeah. But sometimes he's going to bring me through it. And I got to just keep my eye on God, hang on to him, and trust it. When I can't hang on anymore, he's hanging on to me. He's holding me. And I got to believe I'm going to go, I'm going to make it through. And those are the times when you, your, your confidence and trust in God, you just got to have it. You just got to have that faith that God's going to bring me through. Because I don't like what I'm dealing with. I don't like being in this fire. I don't like being in this lion's den. I don't like being on this cross. But God's going to bring me through it. And that's what David's saying here. And when it's all said and done, guess what? You're going to find yourself. Now, when... Uh, when they found out about those men that, that lied on, on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they got thrown in the fire. When those, those guys lied on Daniel, they got thrown into the lion's den. When Haman was building the, the, the gallows to hang Mordecai, guess who ultimately got hung on, those gall on, the, on, those, on that gallow? It was Haman. So that's what this is saying. Let them fall into their own net. And God works that out. So they're setting all this stuff up, and when it's all said and done, they are tangled up in their own problem. That's the prayer that we can pray, just like David did, and watch God bring us through. All right? But we've got to have the confidence because we can't tell God how to do it. He's going to do it his way. And ultimately, it will be for your benefit and for my benefit, however he chooses to do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to stop yeah. there. We thank God for, once again, another beautiful uh, psalm uh, that really just helps us to understand how God is blessing us even in the midst of difficulties.